today we get to hear from our teaching pastor, Pastor Mike Bro. Mike is a personal dear friend of mine. He's a friend of our church and he is one of the most gifted communicators on the planet. In fact, he was my pastor uh, when I lived in Kentucky getting ready to start this church. And he is about to deliver an amazing anointed message on hope, one that fits right into our hope is how series. So grab your Bible, grab your teaching notes, something to type or write with. Trust me, you don't want to log off. This is an anointed message that is going to encourage you today. When he's done, I'll come back up and we will celebrate and sing one final worship song today. But for now, God bless you and may you let the authority of his word minister to your heart and your mind and your life today. Enjoy. Hey, what's up, uh, New Hope family? Man, great to be with you guys this weekend. My name is Mike, I get to teach here. I wanna welcome all the campuses and those who might be engaging with us online. And just wanna say how grateful I am for the technology that allows us to do this. And a big shout out to the team that makes all this happen every weekend. A lot of people have been working so hard, super thankful for them, super thankful for you guys being the church and just shining a light during these uh, challenging times. Uh, so grateful for the New Hope uh, movement. Uh, I brought the, this, this box with me today. Um, as you can see, it is uh, my box of failures. Now, I, I, carry, I carry this with me in the back of my truck. Pretty much everywhere I go, I got this thing. And it's actually uh, getting pretty heavy. Just stuff I've collected through the years that I've really screwed up. And it just reminds me of what a total screw up I am. Let's just, let me just see what, what's in here. Haven't, haven't looked in it for a little while. Oh, man. This is my very first baseball glove. This is awesome. I've kept this for years because this is the glove I was wearing when I let a ball go between my legs and it rolled all the way to the fence and three runs scored and we lost the game. So I've, I've held on to this glove for, for years. Uh, this, oh man, this is a, <laughs> this was a second grade uh, spelling test. Uh, let's see what I got. Oh, this is a, this was a quadruple bogey I got just a couple of weeks ago. Oh man, here's, a, here's my attempt at, at the keto diet. That didn't go so well. Oh my goodness, here, oh man, I got an overdrawn statement in here. Uh, oh gosh, look at this. My very, my very first sermon that I turned in in seminary. Yeah, that was it. And uh, this, this was last week's. <laughs> I mean, what, this is ridiculous, right? Like, right? I mean, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really have a box like this and carry it around with you to, you know, remember your failures, right? I mean, no, nobody would really do this. Can, can we do a little survey here real quick? And I want you to just kind of raise your hand wherever you're at, if any of this applies to you, and wait till I'm completely done before you, like, raise your hand. I'll ask for a show of hands. If you have ever flunked a spelling test, or bomb some other kind of final at school, or if you've gotten cut from a team, or you really messed up an audition, or you got rejected for a date, or you zoned out during a job interview, or you got fired for a little goof up, or a media mishap, or a huge mistake, or if your business didn't go the way you dreamed, if you lost your cool with a three-year-old, if you've ever experienced a moral, relational, social, athletic, academic, financial, marital, or vocational failure of any kind, just raise your hand right now. <laughs> you bunch of losers. Wow. <laughs> oh, you know I'm kidding. You know, no matter how good we all are, every one of us is in the same boat. All of us have wrestled to some degree with failure. And for some of us, we keep them stuffed away. And we actually carry them around with us through all of our life. Well, the good news is there's a perfect God who gives hope to failures like us. And the hope that God gives us is not just a wishful thinking kind of hope. It's a fresh start, clean slate, second chance, rise up from the ashes kind of hope. You know, I've talked about this before, but there's a whole lot of things in life to get way overrated. I mean, movies get overrated, restaurants get overrated, uh, sports teams, they get overrated, vacation destinations get overrated. There's a lot of things in life that, that, that get overrated, but hope is not one of them. 
Hope's not one of them. When we're trapped in a tunnel of misery, it's hope that points to the light at the end. When we're overworked and exhausted, it's hope that gives us fresh energy. When we're tempted to quit, it's hope that keeps us going. When we lose our way and confusion blurs our destination, it's hope that dulls the panic. When we struggle through a pandemic or with a crippling disease or a lingering illness, it's hope that helps us persevere past the pain. When we're forced just to sit back and wait, it's hope that gives us patience. When we fear the worst, it's hope that reminds us that God is still in control. When we have to say our final farewell to someone we love, it's It's hope that gets us through the grief. When we're scared about our future, it's hope that gives us courage to take the next step. And when we fail, when we fail, it's hope that picks us up. There's a lot of things in life to get overrated. Hope's not one of them. As you might imagine, the Bible is full of hope, and the Bible is also full of failures that need it. Hope. I mean, page after page of people like you and me who failed miserably. I'm talking strong people who blew it, courageous people who wilted under pressure, faithful people who were at times less than faithful, people who wrecked relationships and cheated on their family and dishonored their friends and really disappointed God, people who thought that they were washed up, gone too far, really done it this time, never going to recover like the, from this, people, people like us, people like you, people like me. One of those guys was a, was a man named Peter, and we, we studied a letter he wrote this past fall in a series we called Unshakable. His name was actually Simon. Jesus gave him the name Peter, Petros, which means the rock or rocky. Like before there was Dwayne Johnson and Sylvester Stallone, there was Petros. And everything we know about this professional fisherman suggests that he was a man of great strength. He was this big, broad-shouldered guy, calloused hands, outdoor face, rugged and ripped, I mean, just picture Pastor Benji with sandals. Uh, Maybe maybe not. Anyway, Peter was a really good guy with a really good heart. But man, he was impulsive. He was bold. He was loud. He was strong-willed. He was opinionated and usually the first one to speak up and just spout that opinion. On one occasion, Jesus asked the 12 guys, he said, hey, uh, people are saying all kinds of things about me, guys. Um, who, who Who do you say that I am? And Peter doesn't like do a public opinion poll. He doesn't conduct the focus group. He just stands up and blurts out, well, I'll tell you who you are. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus smiles at him and said, man, you are so blessed, Simon, Rocky. On this rock solid truth that you just stated, I'm going to build my church. I mean, Peter was the rock, man. He was strong, committed, courageous, unshakable. At least he thought he was. I mean, some of you know the story. Jesus and the guys had just finished their last meal together in an upper room. Then minus Judas, they go to a place called the Mount of Olives. And it's there where Jesus says to the remaining 11 disciples, he says, this night, all of you are going to fall away on account of what's going to be happening to me. And Peter in his prideful self-confidence, thumps his chest and says, not a chance. Even if all these guys fall away, I won't run. I won't bail out. I mean, these other guys won't because they might because they're weak. But, but Jesus, I'm the rock, man. You even gave me that name yourself. And Jesus looks at him and says, here's, here's the truth, Rocky. This very night before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me three times. You're going to have a chance to stand up for me. You're going to have a chance to die for me like you say you will. And you're going to lie about even knowing me. And Peter says, there's no way. There is no way. I've told you before, e- even if I have to die with you, I, w- I would never, ever disown you, ever. Yeah, I think some of the toughest failures to get over, the ones that we pridefully declare would never happen to us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, is such a good reminder. It says, don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You can fall flat on your face as easily as anybody else. If you think you're so strong that you could never fail, like you would never blow it. You would never, ever break your marriage vows. You would never make a shady business deal. You would never disappoint your kids. You would never lie to your parents to cover your tracks. You would never turn your back on a friend. You would never take a spiritual nosedive. It's saying that you're just naive. And in your prideful self-confidence, you're actually in more danger than those who believe that all of that is actually possible. You know, that's what makes the Titanic 
one of the most famous failures in history. Because the visionaries, creators, and engineers of this incredibly luxury, incredible luxury liner were certain that this was one ship that would never sink. 26,000 ton hull was believed to be indestructible. As it left port for its fateful voyage, a passenger, Mrs. Albert Caldwell, asked a deckhand, is this ship really unsinkable? The crew member replied, lady, God himself couldn't sink this ship. So no one could have imagined the nightmare when on its maiden voyage, this unsinkable ship plunged to the bottom of the North Atlantic at 2.20 a.m. on April 15th, 1912, taking over 1,500 passengers and crew members to their death. The most staggering failures in life are the ones you thought would never, never happen to you, the unsinkable you. And when they do, you're left to wonder if you will ever resurface again. And that's how we find Peter after the crucifixion of Jesus. In John chapter 21, we find him on a boat. Not, not a luxury liner in the North Atlantic, but a small fishing boat floating on the Sea of Tiberias. And the boat itself is very stable. He's the one that's sinking, drowning in a sea of regret, probably, probably replaying that night over and over in his mind, asking himself, how could I have, how could I have done that? I know some of you, you know, know the story where Peter makes that boastful claim about being strong and dependable and courageous and loyal, I mean, unsinkable in his devotion to Jesus. I will die for you before I would ever disown you. On the night that Jesus is arrested and led away to stand trial before the high priest Caiaphas, Peter follows him from a distance and sits down to warm himself around a fire there in Caiaphas' courtyard. He's in a crowd of people but trying to lay low. And somebody spots him and says, hey, you're one, of, you're one of Jesus' followers. Peter goes, what? What are you talking about? I don't, never seen a guy in my life. Another person says, hey, yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've seen you with him. I mean, your, your accent kind of gives you away anyway. You're, we can tell you're from Galilee. He goes, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I, never, I don't know the guy. And somebody else says, yeah, yeah, really. You, I've seen you with him. You're the, you're the guy. And, and Peter begins to curse. He says, I, I don't know the guy. I'm telling you, I don't know the guy. And a rooster croats. Luke chapter 22 tells us that in that moment, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Now imagine what that scene must have been like. Peter runs away, collapses in a pile of shame, starts to cry his heart out. The once proud, indestructible, bold Peter is a failure. No longer committed, no longer courageous, not even remotely close to being, I will die for you, kind of friend. And I'm guessing now as he floats in that little fishing boat, every time he closes his eyes, he sees that moment looking through the smoke into the eyes of his best friend, Jesus. And he feels so worthless, feels forever trashed, can't get it out of his mind. If only he could do it over. And as he floats there on the water of regret, the dude is sinking fast. More accurately, he's just about to the bottom. I mean, can you relate to any of this? Man, I can. Because I think every one of us has floated in a boat called failure. Some of you might be riding in it right now and you feel sunk and you feel deflated, you feel ashamed, you feel embarrassed and you wonder if you will ever resurface again. You're thinking, man, I have ruined everything. I've destroyed my relationship with my spouse. I've severed friendships over politics. I've gambled away my savings. My addictions have cost me my career. My kids may never speak to me again. My folks will never trust me now. Man, I have betrayed my very best friend. I have really broken God's heart. How in the world can a person like me ever resurface from my failures and find renewed hope and purpose? Is there a way to rise above my guilt and my shame and my remorse and my regret? Well, looking at the experience of Peter, I think there are at least three things that he did right. And they're the same things for any one of us who need to resurface in our life. And the first one is this. I love this. He owned his stuff. He owned it. He admitted it and was broken by it. Look, look what he does. Verse, verse 75 of Matthew 26, when Peter remembered, then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. 
and he went outside and he wept bitterly. Now, there's a couple of things in here. The first thing is he remembered the word Jesus had spoken. He remembered the word of the Lord. He remembered that Jesus told him, you know what? You're going to fall. Peter's thinking, you know what? Jesus was right. I was wrong. He said, I said I'd never fall. He said I would. He was right. And I was wrong. Are you discovering that there's amazing freedom in those three words? I was wrong. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, a man or a woman who refuses to admit their mistakes can never be successful. But if they confess them and forsake them, they get another chance. And that's what Peter does. He he owned it. He admitted his failure. He was broken by it. And the once proud rock was reduced to a pile of rubble and he goes outside and he weeps bitterly over his sin. You know, I've learned there's a big difference between being broken and being miserable. I was talking to a woman after church service one time who told me about her 23-year-old son who was abusing drugs. And she told me about his journey and how he comes home and cries and but then he continues to rob from her and lie and con and use. And she started crying. She said to me, my son is so broken. And I hugged her and I said, uh, ma'am, I, I really do hope he gets there. But right now, honestly, he's not broken. He's just miserable. You see, you can be really sorry that you got caught or you can be even absolutely miserable that you're having to deal with the consequences of what you did or Like Peter, you can drop your pride, humble yourself, be genuinely remorseful, be broken, and ask the God of grace and somebody else for help. When you do that, that's when hope starts to rise. Peter was broken, and he owned it. There's another thing Peter does right. It's kind of subtle, kind of between the lines, but I'm telling you, it's so healthy and so wise. He stayed in the group. He stayed in the group. When we find him in the boat, He's not alone. It says in John 21 that Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, and a couple other disciples were there with him. So Peter says, hey, guys, I'm going fishing. We do that, don't we? We return to whatever we knew best before the failure. And they say, well, we'll go with you. So the seven of them go out that night to fish, and they catch absolutely nothing. But at least they were hanging together. They were good friends. In fact, immediately after Peter admitted his failure, and wept bitterly about it, we find him right back in the group. He's hiding out in an upper room with the rest of the guys because you know what? Jesus was right about them too. They would all shrink back. They all would fall away that night. And now days later, Peter is back on the fishing team with these guys. He knew that all of them were really in the same boat, so to speak. And you know what? We just admit it that all of us are in the same boat too, right? I mean, it's amazing how the most of us are like the rest of us. It's why I love New Hope so much. No perfect people allowed here. And it's a wonderfully healing thing to surround yourself with good people who know that they have failures too. There's power in the group. Always stay in the group. Don't isolate yourself in your failure. Sometimes I'll run into people I haven't seen in church in a while. Say, hey, man, I missed you. Where you been? Oh, I've been going through a really hard time. I go, so? Like, where, where you been? <laughs> and now I know that this past year, has been really, really hard. But never let failure isolate you. Fight through the isolation. Stay in the group. Stay connected. A lot of people begin to think, after all I've done, there is no way I could ever show my face around there again. No, no, no. You are wrong. We're all in the same boat. Stay in the group. Well, I have no place in a worship service after the things I've done. No, no, stay in the group. Well, I'm too embarrassed. I'm too ashamed. No, stay in the group. Well, my friends won't accept me now. Then they aren't your friends. You stay in the group. There's healing in the group. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 10 says, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But people who are alone when they fall, oh man, they're in real trouble. I love the way the message puts Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. You might be needing forgiveness before the day is out. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete Christ's law. If you think you're too good for that, you're badly deceived. Gang, we all fall down. Stay in the group. One more thing that Peter does right, and I think anyone who wants to resurface and find joy and hope in real life got to do the same thing. 
He dove in and swam to Jesus. He dove in and swam to Jesus. Here's the scene. Peter's floating in that little fishing boat with his buddies about 100 yards offshore. It's around sunrise, and they can see this dimly lit figure standing on the beach, building like a breakfast fire. And the guy on the shore shouts out to them, hey, you guys caught any fish? Now, that's not a great question to ask fishermen, especially when they haven't caught any fish. And they say, nope, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And they do. And the nets get so full, they start to break. And John remembers the same thing happening like three years prior. And he yells out, it's, it's the Lord. And before he can even get Lord out, Peter jumps overboard and he starts swimming toward Jesus. And in jumping out of that boat, I think he was saying, man, I have thought about this long enough. I'm tired of feeling like this. I'm cold. I'm hungry. I'm miserable in myself." self-perceived usefulness. I'm ready to let go of my failures. I want a second chance. I'm ready to leave my past behind and swim to Jesus. And man, I would love to have a picture painted of this scene where Peter's standing there ankle deep in the water. His chest is heaving from swimming so frantically, water dripping from his hair and his beard, standing there by another charcoal fire, looking through the smoke, this time to lock eyes, with forgiveness. Let me remind you whose eyes Peter was looking into. Peter was looking into the same eyes of a friend he had just betrayed a few days earlier. He was looking into the eyes of a man whose forehead still bore the puncture marks from a crown of thorns. Peter was looking into the eyes of a man whose hands and feet still bore reminders of the spikes that held him to a Roman cross. Peter was looking to the eyes of the one who had died as a substitute for his sins and his failure. And on this beach, on a new day, through a new fire, he was looking into the hope-filled eyes of the resurrected Jesus. And as they lock eyes, Jesus asked him, Peter, you love me? And Peter responds, you know you know I love you. And you know how many times Jesus asked the question? Yeah, three times, the same number of times that Peter lied about knowing Jesus around that other fire. And when Jesus asked him, do you love me? The word used there for love when Jesus says is agape, which is a God-like unconditional love. But Peter responds back with the word phileo, which is like a brotherly love. And I think in saying that, Peter's going, listen, I can't love you like that. I'm not going to make the same boastful claim that I made in the, you know, outside of the upper room. I'm not capable of that kind of love that you're talking about yet. But I will love you like a brother, and I'll love you with all I got, imperfect as I might be. But yes, you know, I love you, Lord. And Jesus says, I'll take it. And since you love me, I want to use you to change the world. Peter, you might have flamed out and failed, but I died and rose so that those failures could be forgiven and forgotten. And Peter, guess what? I still believe in you. And you know what those words, Peter resurfaced and this colossal failure became one of the greatest success stories in the history of the world. With incredible courage and humility, he helped launch the church of Jesus Christ and spread the good news around the world. This guy who thought that God was through with him went on to become one of the biggest difference makers who ever walked this planet. New hope is here today because of men and women like this guy. Check out this scripture. We saw it just a couple of months ago. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Did you catch who wrote that? Yeah, an old fisherman named Peter who dove in and swam to Jesus, who looked into the eyes of forgiveness who looked into the eyes of mercy, into the eyes of the God of second chances. And like me, and like so many of you, he looked into the eyes of hope. And there's a lot of things in life that are overrated. Hope's not one of them. And I just think that God may be trying to say to you today, there's hope for you. You may not believe in me, but I believe in you. And you may have given up on me, but I have not given up on you. Your failures don't have to define you. Let my love do that. In that box, oh, 
Just get rid of that thing. And let me make you new. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for a new start in life. Thanks for a clean slate. Thank you that our failures don't have to define us any longer. Thankful for the way you restore people, redeem people, turn them around. Thankful for the way you met me in my pile of failure. Continue to do so. Thank you, God, that uh, there's no one beyond hope. There's no one that has screwed up so bad that you can't find them and redeem them and restore them and use them. Thank you for stories like Peter's who illustrate that your love never stops pursuing us. Father, thank you for new hope, and I, I pray that you would use all of us to bring that hope into the lives of other people, to let them see that there is a God who loves them relentlessly and fiercely. And I pray all this in the name of the one who does, Jesus. Amen. Did you catch that? Some things are overrated, but hope is not one of them. That is why we named this church 19 years ago, New Hope, which we will celebrate its birthday a week from today. And that is also why we are in a series right now called Hope is How. And it's also why I want to invite you to stay online with us for just a moment as we sing a final song. It's called Living Hope. And wherever you are, I know it might feel a little awkward to, to worship in your den or your family room or your kitchen or whatever the case may be. But I just want to encourage you to stand up or you can worship sitting down. But it might be time to stand up and sing along with our great worship pastors as we celebrate the living hope of the gospel. I'm praying for you this week. Have an incredible week and I cannot wait to celebrate with you next Sunday. I hope you'll join us at a campus if you're comfortable. I have a special gift that I want to give you. We have an amazing worship celebration planned, but for now, let's just worship our God who is the author of hope. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith and he is good. And as Pastor Mike just reminded us, he's not giving up on you. When you don't believe in yourself, he believes in you. And it is in that belief, that divine belief that is born in your soul, that you too can live with a living hope. Let us worship God together. Sing and bear my shame. 
your buried body began to bring out of the side. 